Welcome to the last Real Business of Wine session of the week. And tonight, or today, or depending where you are in the world, we have three absolute superstars of viticulture from three different angles of grape growing and, and basically making wine in the vineyard. Um, from left to right on my screen, you may not see them in this order, we have Lucy Morton, who is a winemaker and viticultural consultant in the Northeast of the United States, who has expertise across a broad range of, of wine grapes from vinifera through hybrids through Labrusca, and in terms of what is appropriate to grow where, and um, without the uh, the narrow view that some of us have had in the past that the only kinds of good wines that could ever be made were made from a limited number of traditionally accepted European uh, grape varieties. Next, we have Randall Graham, who's been famous for God knows, I've known Graham uh, Randall forever, um, initially through Bonnie Doon, um, but I've known him through a speaker, through his stuff, just across the board. Randall is a philosopher winemaker. Um, and um, has got this extraordinary project, which he's been doing for, I think, four years now. I've lost track. We'll come back. A little bit to longer. A crowdfunded years. project. In, yeah. Six years. Um, a crowdfunded project to, cre to create new, brand new uh, grape varieties <coughs> to make a Grand Vin, a Grand Cru in California. And then uh, next to him, we have Arnaud Dafu from Wine Mosaic, um, whose focus is on trying to rescue, to preserve, and promote ancient indigenous or autochthonous grapes from the Mediterranean. And because we are called the real business of wine, um, this is not a geeky uh, event in which we're going to say how much, how lovely this particular obscure grape uh, tastes and how that one doesn't. We are talking really about uh, the, ho the, the holistic picture, which of these uh, grapes can make interesting and good wine where and uh, does it make commercial sense how does it make commercial sense to be using them and um, i'd like to kick off with randall um because your story um is such an extraordinary one in the world of, of wine today and to do something as innovative as you're doing explain please what it is you're doing and why and how right um doing actually a number of things. <clears throat> it's not quite as simple as just one thing, but ultimately what I'm trying to do is find relevance and meaning uh, because there's so much wine, there's plenty of wine out there, but there's really a shortage of great wine or wines that inspire us or original wines. So, I'm, so my thought is how am I gonna create something really original in the new world that is not derivative, that's not a carbon, an imperfect copy of a platonic form that already exists. So in other words, Burgundy has figured out how to do Pinot Noir. I'm not gonna improve upon Burgundy. I'm not gonna improve upon Barolo or Cote Roti. The question is what can the new world do distinctively and different that has relevance? And so I <clears throat> thought long and hard about it. And my conclusion is that <clears throat> it's wines of place that really matter. Those are really the only wines that, that truly matter that are really necessary that bring something into the world that wasn't there before. It enriches our lives. So that begs the question, how do you make a vin de terroir? Um, and the assumption is you're never gonna find exactly the right grape to grow because that's too hard. It takes too many lifetimes to, to do it. But the question is, can you find an interesting wine? How can you make a truly interesting and original wine in one short lifetime? So the conclusion I reached, whether and it's either a really good idea or a really bad idea, uh, nobody will, we won't know yet for a few years, is that perhaps there's no such thing as the best grape variety, but perhaps by making a wine that is an assemblage of a number of different varieties, all from the same uh, parents, one could, by, by de-emphasizing varietal characteristics, by effacing varietal characteristics, one can allow soil characteristics to emerge and thus make an interesting wine. And it turns out that many varieties are pretty neutral, but they're brilliant carriers of soil characteristics. So if I could work in the direction of in intensifying soil characteristics, that could be an interesting strategy. So we're really doing three things at, at Popolishum, which is the name of the vineyard in San Juan Batista. 
We are growing some um, old world varieties on their own. And by the way, Arno, I congratulate you on the work you're doing. It's brilliant and it's so important and necessary. It's fantastic. So we're working with some pretty obscure grapes, things like Ruque and Rosese and Timurasso and just lovely fabulous, misunderstood, unknown grapes, and hopefully try to bring them to life in California. That's one thing Thing we're doing <clears throat> is what I call varietal auto-tuning. And that's a little bit of a goofy name, but it's basically the idea of doing self-crosses. And self-crosses on, on its face is not such a great idea because you have genetic weaknesses that are expressed. So most of the offspring of your, your self-crosses are not very interesting, but a small percentage are more interesting than the parents. And we're looking for, we're, we're creating more variability within a, within a population. And by creating variability, we potentially will see the outliers that are, have unique characteristics or are better suited to the site than the, than the parents. So the idea again is all about congruity, trying to find grapes that really match well to the site. And then the last thing we're doing, which is the most ambitious project, and again, it's either totally insane or not, is crossing vinifera with its set with different, different vinifera and creating a large population and making wines from an exceptionally large. And there's basically two bets. One is that the assemblage of all these different grapes blended together will create polyphony and not cacophony but we don't know because nobody's ever tried this before. It's too, it's pretty kind of kooky and idea. I, I'm sorry, go ahead. And I think Randall, the figure of 10,000 was, was your initial uh, aim still, in terms of different. And in, in still, still obtains, you know, we're, we have um, just identified four distinctive terroir, four unique terroir in our, our vineyard. And we're going to plant plots of 2,500, um, vines of, of each of genetically distinctive individuals in four different terroir and observe if there's any strong differences in the, in the expression of terroir from those four wines. It's going to take a little while, frankly, um, but we're, 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 we're honing in on it. It's, we're making progress. At least, at least getting a conceptual we'll idea of how to do this logistically. So we're going to come back to, to you on um, lots of these questions, I think. But Arno, um, please describe Wine Mosaic. And um, Randall's already said what he thinks. But uh, describe really what you, what you have done and what you're trying to do in, in, in Wine Mosaic. Yeah, so, so Wine Mosaic is a project we've created less, several years ago, maybe seven or eight years ago. Um, the idea, the, the initial idea is to say that there are so many grape variety in the in the world there are over like almost 2000 grape variety in the world but what we know is that 70 percent of the wine in the world is made from only 30 grape variety in france it's 80 percent of the wine that are made with 20 varieties so we thought it was a bit of a shame and we thought it was a bit sad because it was lacking diversity. And we think that diversity is something that is exciting. Um, and um, we wanted to fight for that. So we've created Wine Mosaic. Wine Mosaic is a non-profit organization. We've created with my, my friend Jean-Luc Etievan and uh, Fanny Basto. Also with Louise Uren that you know and Professor Carbono. So all of us, we said, well, we need to do something about that. And what we've done is this organization. Um, it's, it's not a full-time job, so we do what we can. And um, the overall idea is to inspire, to give inspire, ins inspiration to winemakers and um, to gather people who believe that this diversity is important. Um, so we gather them in, uh, in events and also we gather some resources and we try to gather some knowledge. And what we realize is that little by little, um, we can like gather all the winemakers that are willing to try to, uh, to plant and to make wine 
with their original varieties. It means that grape varieties that were here a long time ago that may have been abandoned, that may not, that might have been forgotten, and to make a wine from that. I've got, for instance, here this wine from uh, the French Alps, from Isère in the French Alps. The grape variety is Etrer de la Duy. It's small, so tiny, very, very, very rare wine. And um, well, this is exciting. I'm not sure I'm gonna be able to answer Robert's question about the market for that. I think obviously um, this, is not, this, is, this isn't meant to be a, a mass market wine, of course, and that's not the ambition, I think. But um, coming back to the Wine Mosaic project, uh, what we do basically, we do two things. We try to create some knowledge. So we've got a few um, students that have been working to understand better how people in the Mediterranean area or also in the Bordeaux area have been um, conserving, have been planting, have been trying things uh, with um, indigenous grapes or forgotten grapes. Uh, so that's one thing we do. And also one thing, another thing we do is that for six years now, we showcase those wine in wine Paris or in formerly uh, Vinny Sud, and we give them a showcase so that all those winemakers that try to do things with old grapes, they can show their wines and show their project. We organize quite a lot of conferences. And, um, and that's, well, basically that's it. And um, um, what we see is that, well, we're not, we're, I mean, we're not, we haven't initiated that, but we are um, going along with, um, with, <clears throat> with what's happening in the wine world is that there are many, many, many winemakers now that make wine with unknown or forgotten grapes. Hey, thank you, Arno. I think one thing I would say that's, that's financially interesting, economically interesting before handing over to Lucy, uh, not necessarily in the case of mass market wines, but in the case of winemaking in general, mm -hmm. when I first met people talking about indigenous grapes and autochthonous grapes, they were talking about doing it for traditional reasons, for really a link with the past, and it was almost part of the natural wine movement. Today, people like Miguel Torres in Spain um, is talking about the ancient grapes, the old traditional grapes, because they are the ones that are working better in the climatic conditions that we have today. And it may well be that what the grapes we're seeing being reintroduced to Bordeaux might in the future include ancient grapes from Bordeaux as well as ones from Portugal and indeed New Crosses. And that's my, that's the way I can hand the ball straight to Lucy because part of your job as a, as a consultant um, is to help people decide what to plant um, and looking 10, 20, 30 years into the future in a variety of places from Virginia through uh, New York State and various other places in the US. So Lucy, over to you, describe what you do a little bit and how you fit into this picture. Well, um, I'm an independent viticulturist. I'm based in Virginia. And um, I am going to mention in a minute that Virginia is home to some wonderful uh, grapes that are original to there. Um, I got my degree in viticulture from Montpellier a few decades ago. And um, Robert, I'm not a winemaker, so I'll just stick to the viticulture yeah. part. <clears throat> and um, I think the theme here that both uh, Randall and Arnaud have, have touched on is originality and wines of place. So I'd like to just mention right now, uh, kind of in an introductory way, that uh, I do come from Virginia, uh, but I've traveled and worked all around the world because one of my specialties are Native American beta species. And that's the reason I think, Randall, you and I met trying to figure out what were the best phylloxera resistant rootstocks for some of your vines in California. Yep. So let's not forget that Native American Vetus, while they also do make wine, and I'll touch on that, um, are the underpinnings of most of the vinifera grape plantings around the world. <clears throat> that would be Vetus riparia, Vetus rupestris, etc. But we want, we're not talking about rootstocks, now we're talking about the grapes. And uh, one of the, the, the Vetus vinifera has totally dominated the world of wine criticism. 
and wine quality and et cetera. And, you know, for good reason. <clears throat> Vinifera was part of the wine culture of Europe, and that's where our great old ancient wines developed. Um, as uh, late or as early as the, what, 1600s, 1700s in the United States, there, there were no wine grapes because all of the uh, ancient or all of the native uh, vinifera, uh, vita species in America are either male or female. They're not perfect flowered. The Europeans managed to, through all those millennia of, of finding wine grapes, get perfect flowered grapes. So um, how many people I wonder here recognize uh, the uh, parentage of Concord grape juice? How many people think of Vetus vinifera when it comes to that? Anybody on this show know the parent of the vinifera background of the Concord? No, probably not. But they Concord is a child of Catawba. And Catawba, they have found out, is a Vetus labrusca by Semillon. So we now know when you have your enjoy your Concord grape juice, uh, the vinifera parent there that allowed the Concord to become perfect flowered is Semillon. Now, why would it be a Bordeaux grape? Well, I happen to know because my background in Virginia from the 1600s was from the Huguenots, specifically from Aquitaine or the Bordeaux region. <clears throat> and so there's a reason that one grape that I'm trying to repatriate back to Virginia named Cunningham sprouted up in Farmville, Virginia. Uh, and that is that all those French people brought with them Vitis vinifera grapes from wherever they were from. My family was either from Bordeaux or from Northeastern uh, France. So they naturally brought those vinifera, planted them in their backyards. Most of them died over time, but not before there'd been some liaison with the, uh, the wild grapevines that grow all over the place. So what happened was people would pick up seedlings from their backyard and go, wow, these, these have big, beautiful grapes and they're perfect flowered. And that's how uh, Norton is another, there are only two grapes native to Virginia, Norton and Cunningham, that exist in the world today. Uh, Norton is the star red wine of Missouri. And Cunningham, according to uh, Jancis and the experts in Madeira, on the islands of Madeira, is the second most planted white grape, it's actually red, but makes white wine, named Cunningham. And uh, I'm hoping to repatriate Cunningham back to Farmville, Virginia, where it's origin. But uh, this whole, I kind of, personally, in my career, I mostly work with vinifera too. I work with wine grape, mostly helping people pick rootstocks. And as you mentioned, also pick the variety. But I would say, Robert, for me, it was uh, more people told me what they wanted to plant and I would tell them what rootstocks would work or in what, what fine density and things like that and training and crop levels. But <clears throat> the, the decision on what grape to plant for most of my clients is strictly commercial, except for in the Eastern United States where we have this wonderful variety of choices here because Unlike the Europeans, in an outstanding example of grape variety racism, we didn't we don't we didn't ban grapes with American blood. Uh, there's a wonderful movie out now called Vitus Prohibita that you can rent, um, and and that's how I kind of got back into looking at the origins of uh, of what we call Native American grapes, but in fact they're French American grapes. <coughs> um, we didn't ban those grapes, and so. Um, if you look, take an example of one of my clients in Virginia, uh, Rosemont Vineyard of Virginia is a kind of an example of an estate winery where they have wonderful vinifera reds. Tanat, Syrah, Cab Franc, and Merlot are really outstanding there. Is that all they grow? No. They grow Chamboursin, which is a French American grape. They grow Chardonnay, uh, which was bred in Geneva, New York. And um, I kind of show, shy away from the term hybrid because I think it has a negative connotation like say half breed or you know some of these comments that I'd like to get a little more specific and call them multi -vetus. So Randall, if you get some rootstocks that mate with some of your vinifera there, you may get some varieties that are uh, multi -vetus, 
whereas your vinifera and vinifera are going to be pure vetus, you know, and vetus vinifera. But I think that uh, the world is expanding in Italy, France, Germany. There's this whole movement now to actually reintroduce this concept that came in the 19th century uh, because of phylloxera and all the mildews and diseases that, that went from America to Europe. There's, a, there's some wonderful, exciting new varieties being created as we speak in Austria, Switzerland, Germany, France, INRA has them. Uh, and we're, we're once again back into appreciating the benefits and sustainability of multi-species. So that's my soapbox for today. Thank you, Lucy. Thank you, Lucy. And I think that's there's a thought that again I throw in before I give the ball back to Randall, and we can also get take some uh, questions from the floor. But what is fascinating is what the natural wine movement has done, and I've had one or two run-ins with them. But the arrival of orange wine and the arrival of pet nat and arrival of, has actually changed a lot of people's conception of what wine is and should be. And there's an argument that maybe the, the ways that, that people who were brought up in wine as I was, were taught about wine as I was, who didn't recognize, wouldn't recognize uh, the flavor of a Labrisca or indeed a, a quote unquote hybrid and the, the old concept as being a quality wine. Arguably those wines, the rest of those wines definitely stand in comparison with some of the natural wines made from vinifera. So I think is, is, the, is the concept of what is wine broadening and Randall back to you you're in your vineyard uh, probably assume, I, it's it's all vinifera am I correct on that it, it is, is we, it all we vinifera actually, with you or have you I, well we we actually tried to, uh, Andy Walker and I went to Texas to collect uh, uh, Vitus Berlandieri uh, grapes and we did successfully as for rootstock unfortunately seedlings are exceptionally vulnerable to gopher predation uh, they're really tender and we just got wiped out with our Berlandieri. So I think we put that project on hold. You know, the, the problem is I wish I had started like 25 or 30 years earlier to incorporate non-vinifera grapes into the, into the uh, mix is going to probably add, will add about five or six years to the project, I reckon. And I'm just not sure that I'll be, you know, still sentient at that point. Um, so I think, I, regrettably, I think it's going to be uh, a vinifera with vinifera, uh, just as a real, just, I'm just not going to live long enough otherwise. Well, that's not a bad thing, Randall. Because it's a cool new vinifera grape, we can graft it, and, and somebody later could hybridize with those too. Well, it would be, it would be nice to incorporate, you know, uh, Pierce's disease resistance and, uh, uh, and powdery mildew resistance. That would be very helpful. That'd be really cool but i think it takes you have to you have to breed um, a lot of the non-vinifera out to um i, I think it i think it, it takes several generations to get to that point well uh we found that the chardonnay grape which is half Sauvignon blanc and um half chardonnay so it's more vinifera than than american appears to be uh pierces disease tolerant mm -hmm. as well, the andy andy has got some some uh Pierce's disease resistant variety. The problem is that they're too, they're, they're too strong. He, he used things like Cabernet Sauvignon and Zinfandel. And I actually wanted to start with something more neutral, kind of like something that was more like the Switzerland of grapes, um, rather than the North Korea of grapes, if you will. Well, the Chardonnay is Geneva, New York. That sounds Swiss, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> right, can I just interrupt? I've got a question from Stan Novak here. Um, which I think ties in a little bit of what you're talking about. I'm, first, I'm interested in counter disease grapes, German through Austrian, and the recent story of Bordeaux allowing new cultivars, which of course Bordeaux is looking quite broadly at what it's uh, allowing experimentally to come in. Um, Arno, have you got any thoughts in terms of you wearing the, your French hat? Um, how do you see that? Because the idea of Bordeaux being made with grapes like Touriga Nacional and Marcelin and Alvarino is, would have been very shocking a few years ago. Uh, hold on, you're still muted, hold on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sh uh, sh sure, they will have to find new way to make wines. We know that Merlot, if, I mean, with the global warming, 
what, what is it going to be Merlot in a few years time? Plus we've got this problem of consumer that want less and less alcohol in wine. Uh, can we go with Merlot at 14.5 or 15 degrees? I'm not sure, I'm not sure. Um, there are two ways, three ways we can look at that. Either we find new grapes as you try to do maybe Randall or you know, with kind of new kind of grapes and that's what we, they do right now with um, hybrids and uh, resistant grapes. Or they find grapes from elsewhere maybe more vet, maybe Grenache, I don't know, you know, grapes that are, that fit better in the South. Or they go back to what they did two centuries ago. It's been warm in France in the past already. And uh, there are grapes that maybe were, couldn't uh, um, get ripe, okay, before that can get ripe now. So maybe they're, they're, they were great for centuries in the Bordeaux area. Maybe they sh also should look at those that has been abandoned and that got a strong potential. Um, so that, that the three direction they can look to. And I think they, 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 they are planting now um, resistant grapes. A big question, and maybe Lucy knows much better than I do, uh, the resistant grape Many people think they won't be resistant for a long time. They will be resistant for a few years and after they won't be resistant anymore and mildew and everything, they will adapt. And so those grapes won't be resistant. So, okay. I think that's why, that's what we think is that they should really look in their heritage. What were the grapes that were planted here two centuries ago? Maybe that was ripening only in very sunny years and most of them, they've been abandoned, not even because of market or so, because it, they were often abandoned because they were not giving enough color, not giving enough alcohol, not giving enough yield. But we are not looking for color. We're not looking for yields anymore. We're not looking for alcohol anymore. We're looking for balance. We're looking for small yields and quality. So the reason why we abandoned those grapes two centuries ago or one century ago or with phylloxera is not is, is maybe the reason why we need to replant them again. But that's my point on Bordeaux and not only Bordeaux. That, that raises, uh, Amber, Lucy's raising a bottle there. Lucy, would you like to say what your bottle is? Yes, uh, this is a bottle of why wine that, that was given, given to me. It's Chateau d'Aujac. And it's um, from the Association des Fruits Oubliés, mm. the Association of Forgotten Fruit. Oh, yes. And it, it was a gift to me by Stéphane Bollet, who did the movie Vitas Prohibita. And he interviewed me in Virginia for that film. And as to, to show me what was in the bottle, and let me see if I can, this is, if I can, I'm dyslexic. I, I don't so I'll think we can see it necessarily very clearly. It? But I'm going to tell you what. Not, but then if you, can can you see that? Just stop moving still? around. Yeah, hold still. I'll try, but I'm dyslexic, so it's going the wrong way. It, there we go. Can you Lucy, see that, Randall? Can you, could you read the blend to us? I'm going to read the, what Please. the blend is. Here are 12 varieties. This is in French, of course, um, <clears throat> that are in a conservative. Um, a conservation uh, parcel in um, Ojagwe. The hybrid producteur direct are, and what he's divided it into the forbidden what, grapes that were banned in 1934 outright and the ones that are not authorized. Clinton, 60%, Isabel, 8%, Herbemont, 2%, Noah, 2%, Othello, 1%, and Jacquet, or the Lenoir grape, 1%. And here's what was not authorized. Concord, Baco Noir, Taylor, Cunningham. And this is what got me on my whole Cunningham search. <laughs> I never even heard of Cunningham, and I'm related to that grape. I'm related to Samuel Venable and Jacob Cunningham, who, who, who found it. But anyway, Cunningham, 1%, and Kuderk, 7120, Couderc Noir, 1%. So there is already with this association of forgotten fruits, you know, and again, Vetus Prohibita tells the story better than I can say it, 
there's a wonderful movement to look at these grapes again. And I'd like to respond to one thing Arnaud said about loss of resistance. That's a big argument with people breeding the modern hybrids uh, as to whether how many sites of resistance do they have that maybe a pest or disease could overcome. I would submit this group of grapes that I just told you about that have continued to be resistant for two centuries. And it, as soon as the COVID-19 plague is passed, I want to go to the Madeira Islands where they have the largest um, planting of the Cunningham grape because I am determined to repatriate it back here to Virginia through quarantine. Can I, we, I hope we learned our lesson. Thank you. Anna, it, Anna. Right. <laughs> Oh, no, can I come back to you? There's a one question that seems to come up from what you're saying, which is communication. Because you've had this, all this research going on in Bordeaux saying, how are we going to replace Merlot? And it seems to me that some very top um, scientific people there have gone down, if you like, the freeway, the auto route to modern European grapes. Um, is there a gap in the communication between what people like you are doing and indeed what Lucy's doing and the people who are actually in charge of looking at the future of regions like Bordeaux, but that would be true of so many regions throughout Europe. Uh, you know, there is, is there a, a communication there, gap. Yes. We've got the, uh, the market storytelling. And I think it's much more easier to, story, to, to tell story about old grapes than modern new hybrid grapes that are, that are less maybe less attractive so yes uh, but there there are stories there are new stories to be invented with new grapes of course of course they won't have the charm of those old forgotten uh, uh, grape that we used to have two centuries ago that's not the same story we're going to tell Loïc Pasquet from Libertater you might have heard of that project of this project he's selling the most expensive wine in the world today Whatever you think of the project, the story he tells, you know, it, it, people like it. Um, there, there is a, a wine producer I really like who is planting new hybrid uh, resistant grapes. It's difficult to have charm, the same attractivity when you're telling the story of new modern invented grapes that resist to, even if there is a strong um, uh, a strong story about uh, when you talk about new resistant grape, there is a strong story about um, uh, development durable, uh, sustainability, you know, that we are all conscient of, uh, you know, global warming and uh, all, all those things. So when you said that you will put less, pestic less pesticide in the, in the vineyards, it's a good story, but it's, it doesn't have the charm of the, of the old grape. Uh, uh, I don't can I interrupt? I'm not necessarily talking about the communication with the consumer, ah. which is what I think you're talking okay. about. Yeah, I'm yeah, talking about pro professional communication between the people like INRA and the, the, the professional bodies who are looking at the future of their region, because they are the people who are going to say that the border in the future is going to have Terriga Nacional or Masterland in it, rather than potentially an ancient grape from that might have been in the southwest 200 years ago that, that, that has been forgotten. And is there, a, is there a gap in the communication between people doing what you're doing and the modern uh, scientists who are really forging the future of wine regions? Okay, I didn't get your first question, but it's okay, you, you've got the idea. Um, the, you know, the thing is that Appellation d'Origine Contrôlée in France, you've got those very strong Cahiers des Charges. So if they want to put new grapes into the Cahiers des Charges of Appellation, it's going to be a very long and tough debate. Very long, very tough. There are people who want to go forward, to move forward. There are people who will strongly resist so maybe in the first time, maybe IG, IGP uh, wine will be, those grapes will be allowed in a low category IGP. I think it's going to be a long time before uh, they, they are accepted in the Cahiers des Charges. I don't know Cahiers des Charges in English. Um, 
Yes, and so the, 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 rule, the rules for the region. Uh, Randall, you, you've said in the, in the chat that you've had, you've tried to grow some of the grapes that Lucy was talking about in California and struggled with them. Is that correct? That is correct, yes. Randall? Yeah, I love the uh, funky wines from, from Veneto in, in Verona. You go, go into a cafe and they bring you a wine in an unlabeled carafe, which is they call Fragolino which are the Vitus Labrusco grapes. Uh, I think if you tell uh, a European mm -hmm. they're not allowed to do something, the first thing they say is, how can I do this thing? <laughs> yeah, Americans too. <laughs> Americans too, yeah. Maybe in your neighborhood as well, Lucy. Just... Anyhow, so I, I love the, the so, grappa, another especially. Point I'd like... okay. Yeah, and I love the grappa. I was, um, I was a question from... Video. I'm sorry, go ahead, Robert. I've got a question from Kata Voloshovsky. I'm sorry about you. I'm going to get your name horribly wrong. wrong. Uh, Voloshovsky. And his question is, uh, might there be variants from Merlot that didn't ripen that well before? To which I'd like to chip in quickly that I'm doing some work in Georgia. And everyone talks about Saparavi, but there are at least five clones of Saparavi. And the one that is most widely grown is not the best one um, by a long chalk. Um, might, uh, and we've seen this with Malbec, surely, and we've seen this with, with um, possibly even with, with uh, Carmen Air. Might there be other variants of Merlot that actually might be a better bet than what they've been growing? Anyone? Could I speak to uh, that? Lucy, any thoughts there? <laughs> yeah, please. Uh, um, two things. Yes, clones make a big difference. But also uh, you want to be sure that you still are within the same variety because there have been mistakes in the past. There was a clone of uh, Merlot in California that was actually Cabernet Franc, but let's just, but even within the true variety of Merlot, there's a big range and quality matters. But I'd like to make one other point. <clears throat> Rosemont Vineyard in Virginia grows Merlot as one of their best varieties. However, they're hot. They're almost in North Carolina. So it's a very warm, early ripening site. They do not want high alcohol wine. They don't want the grape to ripen so fast that the flavors don't have to time to fully develop them. So our response, me being a viticulturist was, well, what can we do right there with those specific clones to moderate the alcohol um, uh, development? And what we're do doing is shortening the canopy. So we have canopy heights now at 38, uh, 46 and 52, we've done three years of experiments where we kept the canopy very low, kind of average, and then tall. And in every one of the three years, we were able to distinguish the wines blind just by the canopy treatment. And we are now shortening the canopy there to, because we like what that has done to the wine profile. So there are things you can do in the vineyard even beyond the grape variety. So in other words, are you saying there's fewer leaves? And rootstock. rootstock. Yes, fewer leaves. Think about it, Randall. Look at, think about in Alsace, they have those big, tall trellises for these weeny teeny grapes. Let's say, yep. you know, Gewurztraminer. Go to Chateau Neuf, Neuf de Pop, you've got these puny little goblet vines with these huge clusters of Grenache. Yep. To me, that's the best example of adaptation of a canopy uh, and variety to how much sunshine, sunshine you get. It's, it's basically a function of heat, Chateau Neuf, Alsace, or used to be anyway. Uh, but <clears throat> I think the grapes are showing you in a cool climate, they need more leaves. Vetus yeah. riparia, yeah. big leaves, little teeny uh, bunches. Sure. Uh, Vetus berlandieri in Texas, uh, shorter leaves. Vetus rupestris, teeny weeny little leaves. So yeah, there, it's it's a Could complex I, topic. I'd like to bring in Amber Lebeau, who's an American um, blogger uh, based in France at the moment, who's got a question. Amber, can you give your question, please? Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm just Amber, can you hear me? Oh, yep, yeah, I'm, I'm uh, off mute. Okay, yeah, I'm just kind of curious about how yeah. we think of in a post-COVID world with people not likely to travel as much and also think about too climate change and our carbon footprint, 
is that going to help bring more acceptance through drink local movements in like Virginia or the Midwest and even in the UK where they have a lot of those uh, kind of multi uh, hybrid grapes? Well, I before when uh, Robert um, asked me to be on this show, I texted uh, Jonathan Held of Stonehill Wine Company, which is one of the oldest wineries in America and was the third largest in the world in 1860. Stonehill, I said, uh, and very historic, they have zero vinifera wines. And so I asked John, uh, how many cases are you selling these days? And he said, depending on the vintage, between 75,000 and 100,000 cases of wine, 90% is a state, 100 acres of that is in Herman um, AVA, 82 acres are in the Ozark Mountain AVA. Uh, Norton is their prize red, and they have Norton vines that go back to 1861. So, you know, I think that, uh, you know, the United States already in, in my career is showing huge growth in, in all the states east of the Rockies, and they're not with vinifera grapes because they would freeze to death. So, uh, but, uh, so to answer your question, I, I, think that maybe wine drinkers who are stuck in Missouri, but they grew up drinking beautiful um, French wines, and maybe they love Burgundy and Bordeaux, which I do too, by the way. Maybe they will, as you said, if they're gonna be putting huge tariffs on European wine, and uh, maybe people will start looking more at, at their local, local vineyards, which is a good thing. So Lucy, I have a question about this. Holly, you've My got a question. Yeah, I do. My understanding is that Missouri has the oldest AVA in America. Is that is that correct? I'm, I, I honestly don't remember when AVAs even started in America. You know, we were glad to get over prohibition. You want right. to know what killed our industry? It was prohibition. We had to grow grape juice grapes because you couldn't have a winery here until the 1970s. So uh, I, I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, if Herman, they've been growing grapes commercially as long as anywhere in the United States. Well, funnily yeah. enough, Amber, who's currently got a, got a voice, has just said Augusta AVA was the first beat Napa Valley by Augusta. a couple weeks, okay. I, I believe. Um, so I know that Missouri also has, for instance, a hugely active wine marketing, the association, the Missouri Wine Association has a very active wine marketing um, program. And uh, of course, they're looking at it from a business sense of how do we get, how do we convince users to compare this to something they know, which is a key factor in willingness to try something? How do we create language and messaging around something mm -hmm. that does not have the, um, does not have, you know, sort of the poshness? Um, if we're looking at it from a straight up business sense, what are the, what are the ways that we can get these changes across the line? Because I mean, I personally, as a wine marketer, do feel that this is enormously important for the future simply of our grapes, that, that we have spaces who are growing and proliferating acceptance of native varietals. So anyone can answer that. That's not just at you, Lucy. I'm not putting you on the spot. I'd just like to say a quick thing, and I'd like to hear the others on this, and uh, Randall, too, in, in California. I think it's just being driven by local pride and local farm, and, and that people go to the wineries, they get warm reception. They really, you know, I think the wineries make a, a, a great place for people to go and meet, and they taste the wine, and they make their, up their own mind. But I used to, but way back when, uh, when I lectured with Philip Wagner and uh, on the topic of uh, hybrid acceptance, I would say, well, do you know what the two biggest wine regions in the United States are? Chablis and Burgundy, because we had hardy Burgundy and pink Chablis. And you go, you can get a five liter box of Chardonnay right now at your grocery store. You get a five liter box of Cabernet Sauvignon. So I think we've got to separate out, you know, two, what are we talking about? Family, estate, wineries, local, you know, that, that are part of the community or, um, you know, commercial commodity wine. That, that, that transcends grape variety. So, so just to move that over to Randall, because I know that this is something that's dear to you, what kind of language should we be looking at in the business of wine to communicate 
what we're doing, how it's positioned in context to what a wine drinker knows, why they might choose to try and adopt and become loyal to these alternatives. Okay, well, I can't speak for everyone. In fact, the last thing I want to do is speak for everyone. I can only speak for myself. And <clears throat> I think one has to develop one's own language uh, for describing what it is, the value proposition of what you're doing. So for me, you know, and the French have placed the value proposition strongly in the, in the notion of terroir. It doesn't, it doesn't resonate with everyone, but for, for the people it, with whom it does resonate, it, it truly does. For me, I've kind of got, got an interesting, a different idea. And that is, I'm interested in what makes great wines great. And what makes great wines great is not necessarily, you're not just getting high point scores from influential wine critics. That's one aspect, but that's not the most interesting aspect. The question is one of provenance, ageability, time, and uh, what I would call life force. I mean, to me, the idea that a, a great wine not only uh, has is, com is complex and refined and elegant, but it also has the ability to change and morph and develop, over, especially over time. And it's, it's alive, it's a, it's a kaleidoscope. And I, I, again, if you start to think about wines in this more dynamic way, uh, I think that could be particularly appealing for the people who really truly love, love wine. Not for everyone, but for, for, for ultimate wine geeks, I think it, 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 it carries home the proposition. Could I chip in? Because in a way, and there's somebody with whom I imagine that I, I don't see you necessarily, Randall, as having a great deal of kinship, certainly in terms of the wines produced, but Dave Finney with The Prisoner and with his Oran Swift wines today. Yes, um, kind of different. Is, sorry, is not necessarily doing what, what you ever wanted to do, but he's achieved one thing which is quite interesting and in which there is an overlap, which is that he is focused on blends and he hasn't been focusing on varietals. Now, the thing that, just to finish that, I looked at some, some statistics recently where um, in the US, red blends sell on average for the same price as Cabernet Sauvignon, which is the most popular varietal. The bottle that you showed us, Lucy, is a blend or of, of many varietals. Is the future of, of wine um, introducing some of these unfamiliar flavors to people? going to be in blends where actually what they're buying is the name on the front label and then discovering what it's made from on the back without having to get them to, to cross a line with something unpronounceable and unfamiliar. And, and can I just jump in on that question that Robert has? It's the idea of for you as producers and experts, does that dilute the effort that you're putting into it to have it described or, or a, an element in a blend? You know, how do you feel about that? Arno, how do you feel? Arno, let's include you because you're, you're ancient varietals. Very often, the people who are growing them very often do grow them as, as, independent, as individual grapes. Um, but how do you see the idea of making a wine, not necessarily a mass volume wine, but making wines that will um, actually please the consumer because they're a mixture of, of the grapes as, as in the one Lucy shows. I think it depends uh, for not even mass market, but I mean, you know, wine has, who has to be sold in stores and everything. I, I do really agree that if you've got this blend, like, you know, uh, Gamay, for instance, Gamay and des Trères de la Duit. I mean, something that the consumer knows with something that he doesn't know, he's, he's got both, he's got the best of the two worlds. He's got something that, something that makes him confident and something that gives him like a thrill. So you've got the two of them. And, and I think that's quite a good idea. We, we, I know we had, Robert, this conversation a few years ago with the Turkish industry. Um, of course, if you've got this unknown, uh, unpronounceable uh, grape from Turkey with Merlot and Syrah, the consumer is going to have both the, the confidence and the thrill. So I think it's a good idea. Uh, for, uh, but I think that for high hand wine, for fine wines, um, most of the influencers, I mean, uh, you know, sommelier, cavist, uh, retail journalist, they want something new. They want, and, and, and they need something pure. And I think they will be more excited by this Etrer de la Duit, like pure, with a pure promise, 
that's something with a blend. Although I think drinking this one, that it might be blend. I mean, blend is, is, is a good way to make great wine. There's no doubt about that. So, so I think for the fine wines, it can be uh, not blend. And anyway, for the fine wines, we're looking for an experience and there is someone to tell you about this experience. It's the sommelier, it's the, 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 the producer, it's the, the cavist. So it, it doesn't have to be blend, but for the more mass market, blending is a good, I think it's a good uh, way to introduce the grape. The, Randall, the... you, you are Mr. Blends in this instance with, with your new project. It's absolutely blend focused, isn't it? Yeah, but as I just said in my in the little little note I sent, I think a blend makes tremendous sense in a warm climate, in a Mediterranean climate, when if you want to make a complex wine, uh, generally a monosipage does not have the complexity in a warm climate. It tends to be a little flat or deficient in some aspect. So you only achieve complexity through blending. And every Mediterranean climate, every Mediterranean grape growing area has come to the independent conclusion. Um, monosipage are, are quite interesting in cooler sites with, with the, uh, using soil characteristics as the sort of point of differentiation. Um, that plus the, the elegance of the higher acid wines and lower alcohol. In other words, when, you, when the alcohol is, is, goes up and the fruit intensity goes up, it's kind of like you're, you, you mute the delicacy and the finesse of the wine. So the only way to achieve complexity is through artful blending. Um, Again, I think it could be done potentially this, this by blending. You could also, it, it's kind of counterintuitive. You, you, you efface um, varietal characteristics. And so that's, that is, as I said, a strategy for allowing soil characteristics to emerge, if that makes any sense. Um, there are so many things we can cover. We've only got sort of five or 10 minutes to go. Um, I don't know if everyone's happy to run over for, for a little bit, but just one quick question, Randall, just in terms of your blends, how do you feel about co-fermenting white and red? Um, brilliant, grapes? totally brilliant. It, of course, again, it depends on, are you, are you creating noise? Or are you creating um, complexity? But I love the idea. I did this in Badiran with uh, Tanat and Petit Monsang, co-fermented the two. That was a grower I worked with there. He said, my grandfather used to do this. We're not allowed to do this. I've always wanted to do this. And the, and the results were amazing. So I think, I think for, for many, maybe not all red grapes, there is a soul, soulmate, a white soulmate out there. Um, I'm not sure what it is for Nebbiolo, but there's, there's something out there. Uh, I think the addition of white grapes in almost every instance can be quite interesting for, for, for red co-fermentation. So where so do we... Sorry, go ahead. Paul. I, I, have a, I have a business question about this. Um, wine is is deeply risk averse because you know the business of wine is often crap anyway. Let's just like be completely upfront about it. And one of the key issues that we have when we are talking about becoming resilient, diverse, diversifying our plantings, em, embracing just new things that winemakers want to do is that there is no way to get the stories and the proper business cases from anyone who has tried this. So this is something that I would love to see. Is there a place out there where Randall, Lucy, Arno, we can actually go to and understand what has been tried, what are the results? What are the financial implications? How have we talked about it and marketed? Just basic case studies for what for what you're doing anyone silence With randall's silence. A yeah i'm an anthropologist the anti-business guy totally the opposite I think uh, so clearly what we're saying is we need you we if this is important i know that people like my clients need your stories we need We've to got, understand what you're doing Right. We've, well, got case. Up, oh, go you know, we, we've got business case. Go ahead. You know, we've got business case at Wine Mosaic. If you come to Wine Paris next year, or last year, we've got this. This is a showcase of people who are, who have success. I mean, they've got strong success because they are differentiating themselves with original grapes. 
Um, I love this sentence by Nicolas Gonin. Nicolas Gonin is the neighbor of this guy. He's close to Grenoble. He's been a real pioneer. He's been um, very in introducing new grapes. And what he said, because now he's on, I mean, he sells all of his wine, expensive. It's not a huge estate, of course, not Torres, but he's got quite a big estate. He's selling everything, quite expensive wines. He's on the best tables in the world. And what he said is, we've saved ancient grapes. Ancient grapes will save us. Because otherwise, he would be selling commodity Chardonnay or commodity Gamay from Isère at, at two euros a bottle. Because there, are no, there is no way. And I think Loïc Pasquet with his project on uh, Liber Pater is a good example as well. Many people are, we've got a, a lot of business case. I think of many winemakers in Languedoc. I'm so, I, I really agree with what Randall said about the blend in, uh, in Southern climates. And for instance, in Languedoc, we've got so many winemakers who blend new grapes, like new, like Syrah or Sanso or uh, very ancient Picpoul Noir or, you know, very ancient Mediterranean grapes. And this is also for quality reason, of course, but also for marketing reasons. There are a lot of cases of people, of people having strong success. Um, the, the Obaide grape in Lebanon, that you know they're making white only from Chardonnay, which is a shame. It's, it's an, an ancient country of winemaking, Lebanon, and they did this, this Obaide white grape, which is like a new old grape, and they've got such a strong success today. So we've got a lot of cases, I think, of uh, of business successes. Do you I think do. that what we're where we are today, with uh, let's say traditional ancient grapes and Lucy with your uh, greater openness towards La Rusca and uh, multivitis, if you like, um, are, is this at the beginning of a phase that will be like natural wine where, uh, and maybe it will be part of the natural wine movement in a sense, but it hasn't been so far, I don't think to, to, to as much, that in five or 10 years time, the people who are now looking for zero sulfur and who are obsessed with the fact that the wine's been not been fined or not been filtered. Do you think that the next thing we're going to see? I, I, I think I heard the question. Is it me? Hi, Polly. <clears throat> I, I think that um, he cut out, but let's, let's go forward. Shoot. Okay. Well, I would just say that, um, yes, I, I, I do think that the openness of the young people, uh, and some of the things they're looking for wines plays very well into the broad range of both the grapes Arno is talking about if you're in a European setting or the ones I'm talking about if you're in an Eastern American setting. Um, absolutely. So I think we've lost Robert, but that's okay. We'll keep going. So one of the things that we've seen in COVID, and Eric Asimov spoke about this a couple of weeks ago, is this return to comfort grapes. Right. So, okay, we've got on one hand a balance of local grapes and on another hand a balance of comfort grapes, which in this case is a little bit at odds. So how do we reconcile the heritage with what we know? And again, I always come at it from a business standpoint when we're talking about it, when we're marketing it, when we're trying to get it across. Line. And in fact, I, you know, something we haven't touched upon, how do we look at the finances of what you're doing and the risk that you're taking. And, and actually, I'm just going to jump across to Grant, Randall for a minute on that. Randall, can you talk a little bit about the, um, the risk and the cost involved in well, your choices? Well, a lot of the things that I'm doing make zero economic sense, none whatsoever. I mean, the idea of developing new grapes that take eight or 10 years to develop and iterate you, 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 it's very hard to make the business case for that. You really can't. So I haven't yet figured out how to monetize that particular aspect. But I think ultimately, the, the point of the exercise is differentiation. And I think unless you have differentiated your product, um, you're not going to make it to the finish line anyway. So um, you, you, got, you have to end up with a distinctive product. The other point I wanted to make is that um, you can overthink the idea of 
comfort wines and what are people comforted by? I mean, initially, I think when people are freaked out, they're comforted by the familiar and they reach to the familiar. But, you know, we, we may be cooped up in our houses for God only knows, six months, 12 months, 18, who knows how long it's going to go. And I think we're, I think at a certain point, probably pretty soon, the idea of something new and, and different is going to be comforting to us, is more comforting to us than the same old, same old. So I think, um, I think you have to have a certain intellectual free, freedom to, to, to want to discover the unknown, but I think we're not too far from that. And I think um, young, young wine drinkers, um, it's kind of the flip side. They don't really know that much, but they're also open to everything. So it kind of, it cuts both ways. And um, the idea of a strange new grape variety doesn't, doesn't phase them particularly. And that's, that's a good thing. Yeah, I don't think it's an either or situation either. I mean, I like both the old world and the new world and in between. What I can say, uh, I agree 100% with Randall about differentiation. And the, most of the people I work with in the mid-Atlantic region right here are differentiated because they're family estate wineries and it comes down to the people. And I'd say the loyalty that is being shown to people that I work with who are family wineries that are maybe what 20 years old now uh, they have a very loyal following and they are having sales through the roof of people who want to continue to support them especially with free shipping but and they're having um, meetings like this one webinars where they do connect with their clients and they do virtual tastings and that sort of thing and I, I see that as very important to keep people to people engagement you know what, Lucy, before Robert wraps up, I, I just want to um, comment on that. So my family is just from outside of New Orleans. And weirdly enough, we do have vineyards. Um, they are, and they produce, for the most part, completely terrible wine, I'm sorry to say. But there is an enormous sense of pride simply in the fact that we have vineyards who are trying to grow, learn, produce, and no matter how you feel about the juice, you know, you're going to have your local population who is still supporting that. So I do think that that's a part of a part of the wine industry that is lost with, um, with what I'm going to call traditional widely accepted grapes, as opposed to our historic regional grapes. So I'm so glad that you mentioned that. Um, I know that we're approaching time and I think that Robert has a few final comments. So I'll pass to him. Maybe. Roberto. If he can talk. He's we lost muted. our leader. Robert, are you, muted, I, I think. are you with us? He's um, muted. With you, if you can yeah, hear me. you're muted. Yeah, I can do. Thank you. Very briefly, I think we are moving from a time of the wine industry being run by the 1855 classification in Bordeaux, or Robert Parker and the great names at Chateau Petrus and Chateau Tour, to a new world of wine where there's all sorts of uh, possibilities all bets are off. What excites me is that the great wines of the next 20, 50, 100 years may well be what you're producing in um, California, Randall, which will be something no one's ever tasted before. And it may well be uh, old grapes from the Mediterranean that you've um, rediscovered, Arno, and helped to promote. And Lucy, they may well be wines actually that are not necessarily vinifera. And who's to say uh, what we're gonna need in terms of disease and climate change? So I think we've only, in the last hour or so, we've scraped the surface of the subject. And I think that's, that's as, as it had to be because it is such a big subject. But can I say thank you to all of you and thank you to the audience. Um, I'm gonna be watching this again on YouTube where it'll appear in the next 48 hours. Uh, Polly does all of that brilliantly. Um, and it'll be on a podcast as well. Uh, but um, thank you again for all of that. Come back on Monday, we're looking at South Africa. And we've got a, all sorts of fascinating things next week. But uh, have a great weekend. Stay safe and drink some good wine. Thank you all. <laughs>